Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Kloss Financial Quarterly Review. We're halfway through 2023, and it's a good start to the year so far. My name's Josh Sterling, and I'm joined by Eric Schwartz and Kyle Kite. And today we'll be talking through the first half of 2023. Before we get started, a bit of housekeeping. Today's presentation should last anywhere between 20 to 30 minutes. We'll have a section for Q&A at the end of today's discussion. So if you have questions throughout the entirety of the presentation, please go to the bottom and select the Q&A and type in the question, and we'll answer that at the end. So with that, Kyle, you have a little bit more housekeeping to go over here. Absolutely, yeah. Josh. <laughs> All right. So as Josh said, thank you everybody for joining us. This is our second quarter in review. As Josh stated, it's been a really, really good start to this year so far. So it's uh, good to see, especially after uh, the, the rough year that we had last year, it's good to see it rebound a little bit and makes everybody feel a little bit better. So a little bit about Clause Financial. Those of you, most of you have been clients of ours for a little while. So we like to update this every so often though. So we're officially in our 47th year of business already, if you can believe that. We were founded back in 1976 down here in Rockford, Illinois. We've got our two offices now, Loves Park, and then the one up in Madison as well. We serve just under 1,100 households. A few of you are on here, obviously. And then we have about 19 employees between the two different uh, offices here. And we're up to 31 states that we have clients in. Believe it or not, people don't like to stay around the Midwest forever in retirement. They like to go after the family, go to better weather, whatever it is. So we've uh, we've expanded uh, pretty much nationwide at this point. So thanks again, everybody, for joining us. So what we're going to be talking about today, um, obviously, is just kind of a recap of what's happened, not only in the second quarter, but we'll go back a little bit to the beginning of the year as well. So kind of the big topics that we're hearing right now is... Uh, still interest rate hikes. Those have been kind of the topic for the last 18 months or so. So the big question right now is, will they hike rates again or will they lower them? Right now, the stock market is uh, pricing in a, a rate hike coming up here in July. The last time they take a, they do, um, I guess you would call them set surveys over the people on Wall Street and what they think the Fed's going to do. And right now, the last one I read, it changes every day, but somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of Wall Street professionals think that the Fed is actually going to hike rates here in the next week or two in their July meeting, um, but probably only 25 basis points this time. So they had their June meeting, which is where they decided to pause rates. Um, but while they paused rates, they also kind of set the stage for probably two more rate hikes. So like I said, the one coming up here, Wall Street's thinking 80 to 90 percent chance that they raise it 25 basis points. Um, but the one after that, it's actually about 50-50 right now is what Wall Street's thinking. So we'll see how things continue to play out. It's a little interesting. I feel like uh, in January this year, we're hearing a little bit of a different story. But Wall Street is always right, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we've Thank gone from uh, interest rates potentially lowering at the end of the year to now uh, increasing two more times. It's kind of, right. yeah. kind of interesting how that plays out over time. Yeah, absolutely. None of us have the crystal ball as much as they'd like to think they do. So so the next question we'll talk about a little bit here is when will we turn the corner? So this is kind of what Josh and I were just discussing here. It sounds like they're probably doing at least one more hike, if not two. Um, but we'll see. There's a lot of people that are speculating that at some point in the future, they're going to start actually cutting rates back down. Um, but we'll see how long that takes and when they actually start doing that, if they do that. And the following one that we'll talk about is what's driving the decision. So obviously the Fed looks at a ton of different data. They've been saying that they're going to be data dependent since they started all of this back, like I said, about 18 months ago. So there's a number of different factors. Inflation is one of the big ones that we're going to talk about here in a second. It does look like it's cooling off. And Josh is going to go into a little bit of specifics of what that means, what they're looking like. But that's not the only thing. Obviously, the jobs market is another big one, which we'll talk about that as well. That continues to be very, very strong, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. So go ahead, Josh. All right. So as Kyle said, it seems like we've been hearing a lot of really good news recently about inflation finally tapering off. Um, but of course, the Fed has come out and kind of said that we're going to look at raising interest rates in the future. And now there's a probability that that's actually going to happen at this next meeting. And so we wanted to pause here. I mean, I'm sure everybody's seen uh, this graph over time, looking specifically at the blue line here. That is headline inflation, basically what we're seeing uh, headline in the news, 
saying, oh, inflation was peaking at 9% halfway through last year. And now as of the last one, we were at about 3% inflation, um, which is incredibly promising to hear. But of course, when you layer that on with um, the Fed is going to be looking to increase interest rates again in the future, it kind of leaves you scratching your head. Why are they doing that? Um, the last we heard, they were taking a pause to kind of let inflation kind of settle a little bit, the interest rates that they rose up so high. Let's see if that can get baked into the economy a little bit further before they make additional moves. And now that they're beyond that, at least by one meeting, we're looking at potentially having those interest rates increased again. And one of the reasons that is, is that second line that's on this graph right here, core CPI. Because of course, the Fed would be doing a, a pretty bad job if they were simply looking at just one metric as to what they're going to be doing in the future. Like Kyle said, there's other metrics that they're looking at, including the employment uh, inverse. They're looking at different metrics of, of inflation across the board, like PCE or core CPI. And so the one that we're looking at here, core CPI, essentially what that's doing is it's taking inflation and it's ripping out two of the most volatile uh, figures that typically come into the readings every month, and that's energy and food. And to give a little bit of perspective on why inflation has been going down so dramatically over the past couple of months, energy over the last year has dropped 17%. And digging in a little bit deeper into that, fuel, basically gas, uh, has dropped uh, 37% over the past year, which it doesn't feel like it's dropped that much, but it has and uh, across America as a whole. And it's pretty incredible seeing those numbers driving that headline inflation so much over that uh, period of time. And it's really driven inflation all the way down to uh, 3% now. But the Fed is looking at some of those other figures. So core CPI gets rid of some of those really volatile numbers that jump around every month. And it's focusing in on some of the pieces that really affect us day to day. And of course, gasoline and food absolutely impacts us. But some of those bigger core costs, like housing, vehicle costs, are, are some of the big numbers that really haven't necessarily come down too much, especially on real estate. And it's really left kind of that number higher. And that's what kind of the Fed's watching for. They're really looking out to say, hey, we haven't seen that baked into the real estate market or some of those other pieces of inflation yet. So we still have opportunity to increase those rates over time. Uh, and that's kind of some of the rationale as to why the Fed's kind of looking at the possibility of raising interest rates in the next meeting or two. Yeah, I think Josh nailed it on the head here. This has been one of our favorite charts over the last year and a half, two years, uh, talking to all of you. But we have been primarily focusing on that, that blue line. Um, the red line, as Josh just mentioned, uh, core inflation. You might also hear this in, in the news called like sticky inflation. So um, really taking out the more volatile pieces of, of the CPI calculation, um, which I think actually matches the, the approach of the Fed pretty well. They, they are very methodical and um, really not trying to overreact to, to uh, economic news that we're getting. Um, but you know, as, as we're looking forward, the Fed is generally focused on that core CPI number um, much more than than headline CPI. Absolutely. Well, let's dive in a little bit deeper because one of the things that I said is that uh, this inflation rate is essentially what everybody's hearing across or, or feeling across America, but that's not actually accurate to what each individual person might be feeling in different parts of America. Of course, America is massive um, and everybody's experiencing inflation a little bit differently. So this... Uh, map of the U.S. right here is really honing in on that headline inflation number that we were just looking at, that blue line. So on the aggregate in June, um, everybody was feeling about 3% inflation across the board. But on the screen right here, we're looking at the different regions across America. So the regions that are in the more yellow, orangish colors, those ones are experiencing higher inflation, the inflation that's kind of sticking around a little bit longer. Here in the Midwest, thankfully, we're under the average, which I'm sure doesn't feel that way. Feels like inflation hasn't, or prices haven't been really going down. It really feels like more so that 
they've been kind of sticking around a little bit longer. It feels like things just aren't really moving too much, maybe increasing just a little bit. Here in the Midwest, it was at actually at 2.8% over the last year. But you get these regions on the coast. So over on the West Coast, the Southeast Coast, where you see that inflation rate sticking a bit higher. And some of those biggest differences that are happening is that the inflation rates, uh, components underneath inflation that are higher tend to be higher on the coast rather than the Midwest. And the rates that are actually going down so things like vehicle expenses, for instance, where it's gone down across America, but have gone down less on the coasts. So because of that, you're starting to see that inflation is still sticking a bit higher on those extremities of the USA. Um, but in the Midwest, we've seen it kind of softening a little bit, but still have a long way to go. Yeah, and I think this is this kind of speaks to um, I'm sure a lot of a lot of you are having discussions with family and friends about you know rising prices over the last couple of years and sort of the impact on you. But this this points out why when you talk to people, people may feel differently about the impact of inflation, not only based on where they live, but where they are in their life. Right? Are they are they driving a lot in purchasing new vehicles, or are they maybe in retirement and uh, not? Not getting out as much and not needing to buy as much gas or, like I said, buy, buy a new vehicle. Um, so what, when we talk about inflation as a kind of singular concept, um, it's a little bit misleading uh, when we're when you're trying to compare it to your to your daily life. Um, but we what we want to do is talk about how the Fed views it and how it actually impacts their their decision making around right, raising interest rates. Mm -hmm. So one of the other things that we always keep an eye on is with inflation kind of sticking up higher and the Fed coming up and raising rates, we actually want to compare the two occasionally. And I think we looked at this about a year and a half, two years ago. Uh, and we'll jump in here to this next slide. And this, this slide here looks a little bit simple at first, but we're going to dig into it a bit. So real rates back into positive territory. That might not seem like a big deal, but that is a, a mammoth landmark that we finally hit. So over the past two years, inflation has been going up higher and higher, peaking at 9%. And as we look at that blue line uh, approach 2023, and it goes all the way down, what that number is really showing us is the difference between what you could earn in interest on technically the Fed funds rate, but think of things like CDs or money markets. And so back then, you weren't really getting paid a whole lot, but inflation was really high. And so that really comes into, well, after you earned your interest or your coupon payments on that money market, CD, Fed funds rate, um, how much are you taking home? Oh, and by the way, you have to pay for inflation along the way. <laughs> And so you hit this market where you were earning a negative return when you were looking at what you were earning on every dollar that uh, that was coming out of your bonds. And so for a long time, it was fairly painful. And interest rates over that time have increased and increased and increased. And the Fed has been really trying to ramp up the interest rates to kind of combat inflation. And as of May, we finally surpassed it. We finally had interest rates exceed inflation. And so I believe at that point, it was about 5.25%. And inflation finally came in underneath that uh, around 4, 4.5%. 4 and it's only increased from there. And so now, as we've talked previously, we've kind of moved into a new territory where bonds are finally paying a really good amount, where your bond portfolio is paying 4, 5, 6%. It's kind of a new world that we really haven't seen since... Uh, the early 2000s. Um, and being in this environment going forward, it's a big advantage to people who have uh, investments and bonds. But now that we finally increase beyond inflation, you're finally getting a better real rate of return. And in this environment, it actually bodes really well for bond portfolios. A uh, couple of quick numbers for you. So when we're kind of in this positive territory, the Fed funds rate is higher than inflation rates. Over time, uh, the aggregate bond index returns about 7.5%. When it's the inverse, when the Fed funds rate is beneath inflation, you only return about 3.2%. So this territory that we're in now 
is a really big benefit to the overall bond market, at least historically speaking. Um, and we're finally earning an, an interest rate that exceeds the inflation rate. And it's kind of making things a little bit easier along the way, especially as the overall portfolios have been coming back over time. And when we're talking to clients about this, it's it's understandably confusing because I think people look at rising interest rates from the perspective that they best understand, which is as a borrower, right? We borrow money to purchase a home in the form of a mortgage, or maybe you have a car loan or um, student loan or whatever it might be. And you think of rising interest rates as, as a negative to your financial situation. So in this case, when you're thinking about your investment portfolio, you have to almost flip that, um, that thinking and understand that by owning bonds in an investment portfolio, like your, your um, investment account at, at Class Financial, um, by owning bonds, you are actually a lender, right? You're lending money to, um, to the, the government or to a corporation, and you are actually receiving interest payments. Um, and as rates rise, so, so do the uh, coupon payments on those bonds as they turn over. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think all of this kind of ties into a little bit more Fed discussion about what's happening in the overall economy in terms of the workforce, right? Yeah. Yeah. So inflation is obviously, um, we, we spent a lot of time talking about it today and, and on previous webinars. Um, that's a big consideration for the Federal Reserve when they were trying to decide whether or not to raise rates. But so are the, the jobs numbers. Um, so we are continuing to see, um, I think some at some points to the, the Fed's chagrin, but we are continuing to see really strong jobs numbers. Um, the number of workers in the U.S. has reached and now exceeded pre-COVID levels. Um, I, I'm sure we can all say it maybe it may not seem like that. We've all been to restaurants or, or stores and seen that the help wanted signs and, and um, you know, kind of wondered what happened to, to the workforce. Um, but as you can see here, we're, we're focusing specifically on, on leisure and hospitality workers. We are now um, at a, a higher number of, of people in that, uh, in that sector working than we were in January of 2020. A um, couple of reasons for that kind of general feeling of, you know, doesn't feel like there's as many people working because there's, you know, there's a need for, for workers and we're seeing it everywhere. Um, we are still coming out of uh, kind of recovering uh, from the the impacts of COVID, and there's still this incredible pent up demand for for goods and for services. So as you know, as all of us are are trying to sort of make up for for lost time to some extent, it's creating a much larger demand for for workers that, quite frankly, right now uh, we're we're struggling to supply here in the U.S. Um, the other thing that's that's been pretty impactful, uh, if you as as we've kind of educated ourselves about this, is this idea that um, workers are feeling a, like they have a bit more leverage and they're more comfortable leaving um, leaving a job to go to um, a job that pays them more or that they think would be um, make them happier. So there's this this um, transience to the workforce. Um, that's creating, you can imagine if people are switching jobs more often, well, it creates more job openings and creates kind of this feeling of, um, of a lack of workers that we need. Mm -hmm. um, so it's as we as we keep getting these, you know, monthly jobs reports, they continue to show creating more jobs, people are, you know, people are um, moving around in the workforce. And that can make the Fed a little bit jumpy when they think about not increasing interest rates. It still feels like the economy is running pretty hot to them, I think. Yeah, and we've seen it in the numbers too. Wages are continuing to e increase, although yeah. they're moderating slightly. But uh, we are seeing that kind of play out in the overall economy that, uh, that these workers are having their incomes increase little by little. Yeah, I think one of the, I just seen a stat the other day, actually, that the, um, what they call the prime workforce. So this is workers age 25 to 54. So people kind of in their prime working years, it's actually the highest um, employment rate for that age group since all the way back in 2007. 
And so when we say that we really just don't have enough workers and anybody that wants a job can have one, that's kind of why is that it's it's basically everybody that has is of working age is, is as good as it's been since all the way back in 2007. So that's, again, just kind of more ammo of why the Fed, yes, the interest rates are, or uh, inflation's coming down, but the jobs market is still still really, really hot. And so they're worried that that's going to continue, you know, inflation's just cooling off for a little bit and it's going to come back and rear its ugly head, which is what they're trying to avoid, obviously. So, yeah, it's, it's a math problem, right? I mean, we have, we have a huge, um, a huge generation in the baby boomers moving into retirement and, um, uh, continuing to, um, have the same demand for goods and services. Uh, it's, it's creating, um, some pressure on the, and the uh, ability for employers to fill open jobs. All right, maybe I might call this the million dollar question. Mm -hmm. um, certainly one we're hearing a lot. Um, so we've talked in previous webinars about recession and uh, you know what technically is a recession. How do we know when we are in one? How do we know when it's ended? Um, I think this really kind of ties back to a lot of discussion we are um, hearing and having with clients about this idea of a soft landing. And so this is the idea that the Federal Reserve can, um, can raise interest rates and slow down inflation without completely um, eliminating the, uh, or smothering, I guess, the economic growth of the economy. So this idea that we can um, slow down inflation, but also, um, keep the, the economy growing. Um, I would say probably today versus uh, six months or 12 months ago, the, the hope for that or the, um, the belief that that's possible is probably a lot higher today than it was then. Um, and I would say consensus among economists is that the likelihood of a recession in the next six to 12 months is, is shrinking to some extent with the new data we're getting. Um, but Putting that aside, um, if you actually look back at every recession we've had since uh, since 1945, actually, and you take the average return of all of those on the S&P 500, um, which is a very common um, index that I'm sure many people are, are aware of or watch on a daily basis, uh, it's actually returned a positive 1% on average in, in all of those recessions. And that's Largely because by the time we feel a recession in the economy, generally stocks have kind of seen the worst of, of what they um, will experience and they're sort of on the, the rebound. Um, so to me, this really just comes back to that idea of not attempting to time the market because not only are you trying to um, ascertain what's going on in the economy and what direction that's going, but it's not always lining up with where the market is and what direction it's going, right? So the stock market and the economy are two different things. And we see it really, really clearly when we look at um, something like uh, the response to a recession. Yeah. And I think we hear a lot of times, like maybe if somebody was looking to time the market, they'd say, hey, a recession was just announced. I think the market's going to continue to go down. Let me go ahead and sell out of the market and I'll get back in after the recession's over because it's going to be a much better environment for that. And so what we have on the screen here is uh, essentially just a $100,000 portfolio invested over the Great Recession. And you can see that when the actual recession was announced, the Fed coming out and actually saying, hey, we're in a recession, we need to deal with this. Um, that was announced after the major fall in the, in the marketplace. And then, of course, you did see it go down a little bit in the future. But if you waited around until after the recession was over and officially announced that it has ended, there's a massive part of the return uh, in the market that you would have missed out on. And so we have to be careful sometimes when we have somebody come out and say, hey, it's here. It started happening about six months ago. Uh, that is not necessarily the moment to look at it and say, OK, it's now is the time to get out of the market. And that's why we really focus on just staying in the markets at all times. This right here is a market where we did see a negative return in the market during that recessionary period. But as Eric said, looking at the aggregate over the recent history, um, recessionary periods can return even a positive return over that time. 
And I think there's a more uh, recent example that we can look at as well. Um, in America, of course, we've been talking about um, what's going to happen in the future. Are we going to experience a recession? But there are other parts in the world that have kind of gone through what we're talking about here. The Eurozone has officially actually been in a recession now. It was announced in June that they had actually gone through a recession. So last, uh, the end uh, of 2022, fourth quarter in 2022, um, they actually went into a negative uh, growth period. And that actually continued in the beginning of 2023. And a lot of that really came from the energy crisis that was going to happen. And that happened, of course, because of the war that's going on with Ukraine and Russia. And so a lot of those Eurozone uh, areas wanted to step away from Russian imports, uh, really reduce on the reliance of gas uh, that's supplied by Russia. And so you saw this big concern in the marketplace. Oh, what's going to happen? Uh, maybe we need to uh, revisit our market valuations of, of the equity market over there and let's, let's really drill it down. And so initially you had seen kind of the markets go down quite a bit. But now that we've gone on the other side, um, we've seen that these, these governments spent a lot of money to stockpile energy reserves. Um, actually, the biggest, the biggest part of it, everybody was worried about an extreme winter. It actually turned out to be a pretty mild winter. And then, of course, across the Eurozone, there was this mass conservation for individuals and businesses to try and keep their, their energy costs down. And so what you ended up seeing was there was a recession, uh, but a very, very mild one. And so during that entire recessionary period, from one year ago, the Eurozone is up 19% as of the end of, of June. And so that's kind of an example of what you're seeing here on the screen is even though they had gone through a recession, that doesn't necessarily equate to returns in the marketplace because returns are completely separate from what's actually happening in the market, at least on a daily perspective and kind of the timing of it. The market's typically are trading on what's going to be happening in the future and a recession when it's announced and the end of the recession is announced. Well, that's already been baked into the market for quite some time. Right. All right. So with all that being said, let's flip to what we've seen so far this year. So this year has been a really, really good start to the year as we kind of talked about at the beginning here. So as you can see, though, on the left side going vertical there, you've got the actual monthly return. So while the overall 60-40 portfolio, which a lot of our clients are in, is up 9%, it hasn't necessarily been a smooth, just up and to the right type, uh, type of recovery here. So back in January, we talked about this last quarter, actually. That was one of the best Januaries we've had in a number of years. Um, gave a little bit back in February. You can see March and April were kind of up, but not much. May gave a little bit back, and then June was a good month, obviously, here. So, again, overall up about 9% for the year for a 60-40, and that's with the S&P being up about 17%, the NASDAQ being up 32 and the Dow Jones being up 5 So this is kind of really interesting to see, and especially when we go to the next slide, to do a comparison of 22 versus 2023. So... This is why we're so apt on sticking to the plan. This is why you heard us saying stay the course towards the end of last year as we were going through all of this kind of stuff. Because most of you remember last year, 2022, was a really, really rough year. We've talked about it ad nauseum, basically. The 60-40 portfolio was down 16%, but then six months later here, basically, we're up over 9% so far. S&P was down 20% in 2022. It's up 17% this year. NASDAQ, which is mostly a lot of your big tech stocks that everybody knows, was down 29, it's up 32, and then the Dow Jones was down 14, and now it's up 5. So again, this is why we say stick to the plan, because if you panic and sell out at the end of last year and you're not back in six months later, you've missed out on a really, really good run up here. Obviously, none of us know what the market's going to do for the next six months, but when you miss out on a good upswing like we've had these first six months, it's hard to, to keep up and it's hard to get in and out of the market, which is what we've been talking about for the last 10 minutes or so, is that that's the worst thing you can do is try and time the market to say, oh, I'll get back in when things settle down. Well, 
The question is, what does settle down mean? Does that mean when the market's already back up 5% or when it's back up 10%? Because then you've missed out on some of the upswing that, that would have helped recoup some of those losses from the year before. So. All right, well, with that, we can go ahead and move on to our Q&A section. So thank you everybody for listening in. We had a handful of questions come in, but as we go through some of these questions, if anybody else uh, has more questions that they wanna bring up, feel free to go ahead and uh, send those in. Uh, this section typically takes about 10 minutes. And so we'll have plenty of time for a few questions here. But um, I actually, I love this first question here because I, I think it is something, if you haven't been listening to the quarterly webinars uh, consistently over the past three years, I know I have, but uh, we have uh, a great question here that focuses on something we touched on on the last election cycle. So would you expect the election cycle uh, ramp up to affect the market investment attitudes or performance? Um, and I don't know if either of you want to kind of take this, but uh, it is something that we have covered previously, and I think maybe we should bring it back for the next quarter. Yeah, I think in, you know, historically, there, you know, we may see some additional volatility potentially around an election, but it's not necessarily something that we see having long-term impacts on the portfolio. Um, there's obviously a lot of news, a lot of, you um, a lot of uh, headlines around an election. Um, but if you if you look historically at the market, it doesn't have a strong preference for one party over the uh, one political party over the other. Um, it's it's really just about kind of how investors are reacting to the news of the day. And there tends to be more of the news of the day, uh, mm -hmm. more news of the day around election time. That's my thought, at least. Yeah, yeah. No, and I think the data speaks directly to that. When you plot it out and you look at kind of um, the party that's in office at the time, um, during that time frame, the general rule of thumb is that everything increases over time. And when you look at it, I think we ran it since the 1920s, 1930s. It's basically agnostic uh, across the board. Um, it doesn't matter really who's in office. The stock market has positive returns. When you actually add it all up, they're really similar on the overall returns that everybody experiences, depending on who's in who's in office at that time. Like Eric said, it'll probably lead to some short-term volatility, right? Day to day, week to week, is you know things issues get brought up and these types of things come come to light. But as soon as you start stretching it out over six months, twelve months, they're absolutely right that it's actually pretty much agnostic to whatever party's in the in the White House at that time. Mm -hmm. All right. So the next question I actually love because we talked about this during our employee quarterly webinar uh, yesterday um, with all of our employees. Uh, it was, uh, is tech the main driver of returns for 2023? So I guess looking at uh, the last month, the beginning of last month in June, there were a couple of headlines that came out and dug in pretty deep and were pretty accurate a lot of the overall positive return on the market actually happened from five to seven different companies that are in the S&P 500. If you think about that, that's a really small part, at least a number of companies wise, that's driving the overall return on the market. And so I'm gonna use rough numbers here because I'm going off of memory, but the top five stocks in the S&P 500 up to the beginning of June had returned over 50% in the overall market. And the S&P 500 as a whole returned roughly 9% in that same time period. So really those top five stocks were driving a lot of the returns. But over the, the rest of the period of June, we actually finally saw more of a broad uh, market rebound and the, the rest of the S&P 500 started lifting up those returns a little bit more. So by the end of June, the overall S&P 500 market was around 14, 15% returns uh, in the first half of the year. So while tech was a big part of the story for the beginning part of the year, we've finally seen a more broad support in the marketplace. And I think some of those, especially some of those tech companies, they were also the hardest hit in 2022. For instance, I think Meta, which is Facebook, was down like 80% from high to low. 
plateau. And obviously it's come roaring back this year too. So sometimes you, most of the time, your biggest winners are actually ones that got hit the hardest, the, uh, you know, the six or 12 months before that. So it's not, not unusual to see that. Mm -hmm. All right, we have a fantastic question that's about the local housing market. And Eric, I don't know if you want to lead this one, but uh, so we have a great question. Why is Madison housing market for rents, especially running so high compared to the rest of the country? That is a that is a very good question. Um, and I, largely it comes down to um, supply and demand. There is a shortage of housing um, here in Madison, not only for the current people who live here, but the fact that a lot of people are moving here um, quite rapidly. So as as that demand for for housing um, continues to rise, the the costs, even with rising interest rates, the costs have stayed um, pretty consistent uh, compared to what we've seen in in over the last year and a half, two years, um, with the really really high cost of of purchasing a home. Now on the rent side, the, the same thing is happening. Uh, the, the companies that are drawing employees to Madison specifically, um, taking you know the tech space, they are generally bringing in um, a younger workforce that perhaps isn't in a position or ready to purchase a home and they would prefer to rent. So the, the already crunched um, housing and rental market uh, basically continues to um, to worsen, not worsen, but um, it, it become it, a harder space to yeah. kind of be in, rent in, look for a home in. Yeah. And I mean, you you see this happening in a lot of major cities across America. I can't remember what the report was, but I did see a report that housing cost in Madison was the biggest was the biggest in all the cities across America. I think it was about 13% year over year increase uh, for the housing market here in Madison, which was I think about a percent higher than the next closest city. But you still see housing costs in some of the other major cities, uh, Boston for one, or over in San Francisco, where you have these incredibly high uh, housing market costs, especially on the rental side as well. So like Eric talked about, when you have employers that are hiring, you have people that are over on these coasts that are saying, you know what, it's really high cost of living. Madison looks like a really good spot to be able to go to, but it's relatively cheaper. And so you have all these different pieces influencing uh, some of those market rate increases that are happening here in the Madison market and really contributing to the overall demand. I mean, I think we could sit here and talk about this for a couple of hours the whole evening, but uh, yeah. yeah, it's a lot contributing to it. And, and part of it is, you know, what you, you know, the, the adage is that the house, houses, housing prices should go down when interest rates go up. Well, when housing prices aren't going down because there's no supply and interest rates are going up, that makes housing affordability even worse. So that just pushes more people into the rental market, which again, just dwindles down the already short supply. So a lot of things that go into it, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. All right. I think this uh, uh, last question, oh, actually, let's see here. Yep, so this is a great question that we had just come in that kind of piggybacks off all that. Will higher lending rates eventually slow down the housing market? I think this is a very pointed question towards what we actually might see in the future. Um, Kyle, do you, wanna, do you wanna talk on this a bit? I can, yeah, you would, in theory, higher higher borrowing costs would in theory drive down lending or drive down the housing prices because again the way that most people buy houses is they look at how much they can afford on a monthly basis right some of that goes to principal and some of that goes to interest so when housing prices are high and interest rates were low well you could get a lot more house for the same monthly amount because you weren't paying as much to interest but now that interest rates have gone up that means that people may not be able to get their twenty, thirty thousand dollars over asking when interest rates were so low because so much of that extra asking price that people were willing to pay is now going to be eaten up by their monthly interest payments because the amount of interest you're paying every month towards your mortgage is a lot higher than it than it used to be. So the short answer is, in theory, yes, it should drive prices down. We just haven't quite seen that quite yet. Absolutely. I would completely agree. It's it's almost like the 
demand part of it is going to be discouraged over a, a long enough period of time. If the Fed comes out and raises rates one more time, two more times, maybe more in the future, hopefully it starts taking some people off the table from really inducing all that demand uh, in the real estate market. We'll see. And I think going back to what we had talked about earlier about inflation not being felt equally across the country, the the um, real estate market is very regional, and it it in some places it may you know prices may come down more than others depending on um, where people are moving and and what the housing supply looks like. Um, but to Kyle's point, in theory, yes, in in the over the long run, it, it should. Um, but I think we're gonna. Um, it's going to be very, very um, different based on based on where you live. Mm -hmm. All right, perfect. Well, that's all the questions that we had come in today. We really appreciate everybody for joining us here today. We'll be back in about three months for the third quarterly review. Thank you, everybody, for joining us here today. We'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you, everybody.